Just want to remind everybody to come back at 3.45 for the Tim Crane fireside chat. It's going to be sensational. Um, so right now, let's talk about reinventing television. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Mariana Danilovic. Everyone, thank you for joining us at this later hour of the conference today. And we have some exciting panelists. I will introduce them first and then let them introduce their background and their companies. Starting with John Heinsohn with uh, Bunny Graph Entertainment. Okay, you're, you're our first panelist. So let's you want me to go? See. Yes, please. Sure, okay. <laughs> I'm John Heinsohn. Um, I'm a multi-platform producer. My background's in traditional TV. I've been in digital for about seven years um, as the uh, mobile space and the web space have been expanding. Uh, this year is probably my busiest year in the space. I was the director of production and lead for uh, the Oscar.com and the Academy Awards on ABC. And right now I'm a director of digital media for a global concert event in Australia that's going to be later this year, uh, building out their, um, uh, their website and their social community. Fantastic. And Ryan Stoner with Mopix. Hi, I'm Ryan Stoner. I'm the CEO, CEO and founder of Mopix. Uh, we're focused on making it super simple for studios or individual content creators to distribute brand and sell their content as apps. Uh, as most of you know, it's super simple for anyone with a book or comic book to self-publish their content to any platform, uh, but it's really hard for a long-form filmmaker or um, content creator to do so. And, it, and it's even harder to distribute to multiple platforms. So we're trying to solve that problem. And a big problem it is. <laughs> Laurie Ann Schaaf, producer of digital and digital content consultant, and she's worked with some of the giants in the space who shall remain, yeah. remain well, nameless well, today. <laughs> so <laughs> hi, I'm Laurie Ann Schaaf, and um, I'm an independent documentary producer. I'm the CFO of the International Documentary yes. Association. And I've worked as a consultant in the television and film space for many years, starting with um, HBO's first international launch in Budapest, Hungary. I've worked in uh, Brazil, Latin America, Mexico, for Televisa, Telecine, Cine Canal, Paramount, MGM, Universal, Fox. And I uh, do uh, consult on the digital back end for, um, for Netflix currently but I don't work with them on their acquisitions and programming platforms, so I can't speak to that. But I'm very excited to be here, and thank you. Thank you. Jesse Albert, producer and consultant for film, television, and digital, and let's hear some, some of your background, Jesse. Um, okay, so yeah, Jesse Albert. Um, that's ICM, digital agent, branded entertainment, uh, which basically means anything that was non-traditional. Cover gaming, original IP, uh, branded entertainment, digital strategy for our clients and on and on and on. Uh, before that, I handled digital entertainment for uh, Simon Fuller, creator of American Idol. Um, I go back in the digital space to 96, 95, and right now I produce across all platforms. Fantastic. Al Lani from Social Analytics. Sure. I am Al, uh, founder and head of client success at Social Analytics, and we're an on-site social platform. So our goal is to make every site social. And we built this platform that instantly adds functionality onto sites that adds the social layer and helps them recognize ROI from social media. And we work with really large brands like entertainment.com, Swat, Show, Channel Cache, and a bunch of others uh, for that goal, so. So we kind of have who's who of uh, producing for television and then producing for new forms of television and new platforms. Um, and the first question I want to ask all of you, you, you had, most of you have been on the traditional television side as I have, um, and also probably on the traditional film side. Um, how has the world of production changed today? <laughs> well, you know, I'll we start with an easy question. Right? Yeah, start with an easy question. How has the world changed as we know it? Um, uh, well, I think the the big question that I believe people at this conference are looking for is also, you know, how 
it's, it's about monetizing content, right? So there was a traditional model where you could, um, you could produce content in a traditional model and you knew what you were going to make and you knew where you were going to sell it and what platforms it was going to be presented on and, and sort of who the gatekeepers were going to be and who your audience was going to be. And that changed from, you know, network TV, you know, st movie studios, network TV, into cable TV, and now into what's next. So we're, we have internet platforms, but we also have um, the apps and all of the, you know, ancillary methods of uh, monetizing content. So it, it seems like the big question is how people are taking individual product and then um, finding the right deal for that particular content. And that's, that's what it seems like this, everyone here is in the daily business of doing that. And who are the networks, the gatekeepers now? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna jump in. I, I think that's kind of the problem uh, that we have right now. Um, so I, I'm only gonna speak from my personal experience, right? Because um, it's really easy to kind of hypothesize about stuff, but, um, what I see happening now with content is um, as it's being disseminated across a multitude of platforms, um, there becomes really no one place and no systemic mechanism for tagging content. So you have a giant, well, I was going to say clusterfuck, but I won't swear. Um, <laughs> so, but, we can but, erase that, I think. Yeah. So uh, you can bleep that when you broadcast it. Um, so we have a, a big problem, right? Um, you have a lot of studios and, and networks who are creating content looking to put it online, um, and they're not clear on how to monetize it. Um, you have, obviously, places like Hulu that are up, um, and then you have traditional means as well. Um, I think it's opportunity for all of us. Um, you know, it, it's hard to find um, content as a user. <coughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, you look at what's happening on YouTube, for instance, with all the channels. Um, again, if you're uh, at YouTube, get a room. Brian, Suzanne, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, pay attention to the panel. <laughs> so, um, what's happening, right, is like, you know, we're, we're going from television where we know exactly what's on and when it's on to pervasive content everywhere, but an inability to really find it, right? So you have all these premium channels, for instance, on YouTube that are great, that people are spending a lot of money on, but uh, unless you're getting marketed from, you know, the homepage, you're probably not generating a lot of traffic right now. Um, you know, Netflix is a fantastic place to go. Who's fantastic? All these places are great, but then you're also starting to see people try to disseminate their own content, and we'll hear people talking about apps and stuff like that. So. It's a convoluted marketplace, and it's got a lot of challenges right now. Um, or, and I actually think Suzanne, you, you taught me this. You know, I think this is your catchphrase, but you know, we live in perpetual beta now, right? Um, which is an opportunity, I think, for everybody. Yeah, John, I, that's sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. I would just add to that real quick. I think um, a lot of content is created uh, agnostic of, of a distribution channel, um, and what we really need to go towards is, is you know, bundling kind of production and distribution together and, and creating content for specific channels. Um, myself, when we were first starting Mopix, we got a lot of content creators that wanted to basically take, you know, content that historically lived in the digital distribution world, which was mostly just the, the, the film file, not the behind the scenes, not the extras. You know, I can port that over, yeah, but that's not going to be the best experience for the end user. Um, versus there's a lot we can do with the app platform by, you know, bundling all that behind the scenes and that full DVD experience and adding social media. Um, but again, it's, you know, to maximize that channel, it's about creating something that's unique. And I think that goes for, you know, YouTube as well, uh, Netflix and every other channel. If, you know, as you see more and more content creating specifically for that channel, it's going to start engaging with viewers a lot more. Sure. So, you know, I think, I think we're definitely in an age of a new production model. How many of you are content creators? Web series and whatnot? Okay. So here's, here's the thing, if you think about it from the studio's perspective, now that the studios are, are starting to take notice of people like you in the room who are creating short form content. You know, a half hour episode of television is $1.5 million. That's about $67,000 a minute. Because there's no standardization about length of episode orders and things like that, there's, there's no framework to work off of, right? Now we all know that networks are not paying $67,000 a minute for web and mobile content, right? So what do we have to do? The, the unit of measure, right, is the cost per minute. So as you develop these shows, whether you're going to do your 10 episodes 
or your 100 episodes is you've got to create a model that can be economical. And here you are, you've got your web series, you're going to make your 10 episodes at whatever the price point is. You've got to develop that initial price point in a place where you can replicate that. Because boy, if they love 10 episodes of your show at this price point and they want 10 more, you've got to deliver on that. The problem that a lot of people have is that they, they make those first 10 episodes on the cheap and then once you go to that next level, they want more money and it's very, very difficult. Right? And then also creatively, that's an issue too, is the whole idea of does your characters have the legs for 100, 300 episodes, right? Because nobody knows you. Does it have to be on every day to bring you back? So, John, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because is there really a difference as we sit here today between the cost of program production? Is it, is it, isn't it the networks now kind of going into reality show and other types of programming that are cheaper and cheaper to produce and they're not necessarily all sitcoms or, you know, or dramas that, that cost in, in, in the ranges that you're proposing? And isn't it true then that, that, that everything that's produced for the apps and the web is actually costing more and more and looking better, just like the games are producing better and cost? So what are the financial models? And I think Lorianne talked about this. Like, what are some financial models that actually make sense today for content across platforms and you know, not at the high end and not at the lowest end of, of, of the spectrum? Want to address it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, I think that's the big question. I mean, I think every kind of, every program, every piece of content, it's going to depend on the content. Um, so a feature film that um, you can turn into a game and an app and have behind the scenes is, is going to have a completely different model from a web series. Um, and uh, something that, you know, starts out, you know, 10 half hour shows. Uh, that you're going to try and push out through social networks. So, so it, it really is going to depend on your content and then finding your audience. How, how does that kind of content connect with an audience and, and you know, where is that? And, and there's your key point. So the television audience we sort of assumed was there, or the movie audience we sort of assumed was there. So Al, how do we get the audience today to all this other content so that it makes sense financially? Well, but even the, the television audience has been um, segmented, right? Because you have the broadcast and then the cable and the narrow casting and the broadcast. You know, so that has already begun. And I think the internet is moving into that space as well because you do have people like you know, YouTube or, um, you know, Google and Hulu and Netflix, all, they all have a, a different kind of audience. So Lorian says it's all segmented, how do you find it? <laughs> One of the things we always talk about in terms of this is, we, we, we've been talking about the push economy, it's always been push, 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 put it on there, put it on there, let's put it on social networks and hopefully someone will do this, let's push it here, push it there. I think the world is changing to people consuming content in a very different way. Uh, specifically, when I speak from a social standpoint, you know, any effect of trying to push something onto a social network almost always never works, unless you're willing to spend a tremendous amount of money on ads and that sort of it on through Facebook and that sort of it. But when we're talking about, and this is why I think to Ryan's point is creating content that's specific to the channel you're going after, and then sort of doing that is very important because. If you go with the same content that is created for a specific type of audience, it's never going to work. Um, and, and so that's sort of the, the, the big differentiator that I think is coming up. So I, I think we're talking apples and oranges here, right? Um, so we can create content and hope that we generate an audience. Um, we can hope that it's appropriate for uh, a channel that you are pushing to or, or creating content where the audience is already there. And then you're dependent upon a, a revenue stream of either some form of freemium or you know banners and skyscraper ads at some CPM that is basically not going to pay your rent. Um, or you can create content and you can, to a certain degree, replicate uh, the television model um, where you're looking for mass audience. You you know I mean the fact of the matter is is if I'm creating content for a brand and I am I'm doing some right now right. Um, the scale is absolutely different. You're talking 60 someone, you know, I'm getting about like ten to twelve thousand dollars a minute, right? So I'm gonna have to find a way to shoot it far less expensively than uh, you would in television. But 
at the same time, the quality of my programming has to be the same as television because the way I'm going to slice it and dice this to get a return on my investment is it may deploy on Hulu, for instance, in the United States, but it may also run as a television series in the rest of the world. And I'm doing some of those models, right? Um, so I have to have television quality programming, um, which means it costs a lot of money, right? And also, quite honestly, though, I can win bid by doing it, right? So I have a project now where um, it will be funded entirely through brands, right, rather than worrying about banners and skyscrapers. Um, we'll get probably, I think ultimately, we'll end up having to raise about $3 million from brands for this because there has to be a media buy that goes along with this, which is what's going to drive the eyeballs. So I can go to the brand, because the first question the brand is going to ask is, what's your distribution going to be? Right? So I could say you're going to have 35 million people see this, in essence, because you're buying those eyeballs, right? Um, but 35 million people will see my content, and in exchange, I will get it produced uh, with the funds from the brands, and then I'll make some money off of that, obviously, and then I'll turn around and I'll flip it in foreign distribution, I'll sell it as a TV series. And even if I don't sell it as a TV series, uh, a lot of these, and, and we've done this as well, will be... Uh, have a theatrical release, or it'll be a three-part miniseries in Bulgaria, and it'll be uh, Mobisodes in the UK, and it'll be electronic sell-through in all other territories, and it'll be absolutely windowed uh, domestically after it runs on Hulu. You know, we'll find other windows for it, depending on how the deal works out, right? So, in a sense, I don't think we're necessarily reinventing the television model. I think we're changing windowing, and we're changing kind of production budgets a little bit. But, um, and, and you know, look, there, there is content that can be created that speaks to a niche audience, right? And you can make a living doing that. And, you know, some of these you get a really good CPM as well, right? But it costs a thousand, which is your advertising revenue. And you can make a great living off of that. Um, but I guess when I say apples and oranges, you know, we're talking about, you know, trying to generate seven figure revenues on a, a particular property uh, versus maybe seven figure revenues over you know, a channel over a large period of time. And then, yeah, I think what you're talking about, maybe perhaps your oranges are like the new formats I'm of talking, television. We're not talking the annoying orange, by the way. Right, so let's say, let's say your grapefruit is the new format in television, right? Because you, you just described something that people did when they created original formats, which is, here's the American Idol, and this is how it's going to be set up, three judges, X many consultants and, uh, and uh, contestants at the beginning, and they get all weeded out one at a time, and you have a winner, and the audience votes or doesn't vote. And here it is for this country, it's going to be a different panel of judges, different language, and so on. But what you just described is here is the format in the UK and the types of devices it's going to be distributed in, and it's going to be on television in such and such markets, but yet it's still the same program. So it's almost like a digital format. Well, I, just, I guess we're shooting things in, in a manner where we understand that it's going to be cut up in a multitude of, of lengths and it's going to be distributed in multiple, a multitude of platforms. Right? So you're thinking about that in terms of when you're creating programming. But, um, I don't think it's entirely all that complex. You know, you're just, it's just how you're editing. And it may actually be reproduced, is what I'm saying. So you could con conceivably create another product. So selling the format you're talking about. And selling it in the same format to the same countries in the same way, and therefore it becomes sort of a format. Sure. And it's the way you define it. And it may be completely different the way you distribute it to those countries and, and what kind of content it is the following year and the year after. But at the moment, it's as close as we've gotten to defining an, another model of television based on what you described. You have another one for us? Uh, sure. Well, okay. I, I actually think what the studios and networks are going to do is that as they embrace short form content extensions of their broadcast brands, the, whether you call it multi-platform or transmedia or what, I think what's going to happen is as they make this fundamental shift of creating this content through principal photography and not marketing, that as this content reaches out and the web becomes more of a programming platform, you'll then be able to draw the audience through this short form content, which are extensions of their broadcast brands, and then get into business with people like you who are creating new formats that speak to that same sensibility as the broadcast brands. 
And as soon as, you, as soon as the web becomes more of a programming platform, you can then cultivate short form content in the broadcast series. I think that's really what's eventually. Um, I'm trying to understand this whole idea of short form content. It, it, I mean, is it one minute? Two minutes, Depends who you talk to. I mean, minutes. when I first started the mobile what space, is this short? sure. I mean, when I first started the mobile space, the first project I did in 2005 uh, for mobile, um, I wasn't sure if it would be three minutes or seven minutes. And in terms of testing the waters, I kind of settled in at about one to three minutes for mobile, two to five for broadband. But you see a bit of everything. If you talk to Europeans about comedy, it's 30 seconds. It just depends. That's why the unit of measure is the cost per minute. I had a project that I uh, was developing. It was a one-day shoot with a three-day post yielding 20-plus episodes, depending on the length of the content, paying everyone, paying SAG, paying everything shot in a studio environment by death. It was $50,000 as a price point. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's before branding. So now if I get into business with Jesse and get a brand on board, that gets pretty cheap. The great thing about that was, and one of my focuses then was, to have a pricing model that could be replicated. So after those 20 episodes of 50 grand, I could go in and do another. So that if it, it did get an audience, you immediately could stay in business. So you just answered another question, I think, which is, again, very important. What is, when we think of a format, is it really about the length anymore? And it isn't, right? It's really more about distribution, maybe, the way that it's going to be viewed, the size of the screen, the type of environment you're going to view it in, the genre of the content. Maybe all of those divisions still exist, but the, the length may not be as important as it was the year before and the year before, right? That's so if you look at, um, really, the people are watching 22 and 48 minutes of content just fine, right? So you can theoretically you can go as long as you want. Um, I don't think, honestly, I've, I've done deals with just about all the distributors, and none of them have a set format at this point. Uh, it's changed in, in the middle of doing deals. It's gone from 22 to 12 to 11. What about seven? I, I, you know, nobody knows. And everybody has their sweet spot, um, and generally it ends up being, you know, how many, uh, how many advertisements they want to run in between their content. So we, in the, I think we spent like 15 minutes so far, and we addressed, uh, the gatekeepers are different, the funding models are different, the length of content is totally different and no longer really has the meaning that it had in maybe last year. And we're also talking about the format of the content and what's considered a format is no longer kind of the same as it was. What else has changed? What do you guys think? Um, well, I think the branding model has certainly changed. So I, I used to work at ICM where Jesse worked as well. And in the mid-90s, I was part of the global branding group. And the model then in the mid-90s was really about uh, representing brands like Gap and Starbucks and having them offset license fees at a time when cable was really taking off. And back then, it wasn't about everybody wearing a Gap sweater in the show. It was really about speaking to what the brand is all about, digging within the brand brief. Well, now you're speaking like an advertising agency. That's how they think in terms of the brands. So if you have a show about two guys in the bar, it's not about the Coors bottle being on the bar. It's really about digging deeper. It's not product placement. It's really what does that brand represent and who are the people that live within that world. And at a certain point, you're going to have some great successes and they're going to drive some great revenues. And the branding is going to be so seamless, it's really going to set a trend on for the future. And We're who, not there yet. So, so to, that, to John's point, since the branding is, is fundamentally shifting, the way that the brands are represented in this media is, is fundamentally shifting. Do we have better ways of measuring this socially, Al? Is there anything that we have now at our disposal to actually measure what he's postulating? Yeah, so I mean, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of, uh, you know, a, a project that we did back in the day, um, you know, uh, Teleflora, um, it, you know, does Super Bowl ads every single year. Um, and I used to run e-commerce for Teleflora back in the day. Um, and one of our challenges was to look at what the ROI was uh, as the outcome of that Super Bowl ad. Not just as a direct response right away, but as the distribution that happened afterwards through social, through mobile, through a bunch of other channels. And what we discovered that the direct response was literally negligible, but the aftermath of that happening was, was, was a lot more. Now how we calculated that, specifically to the social channel, was essentially by you know by looking at uh, multiple factors. I mean, specifically when you're looking at direct outcome, when in this case was commerce transactions, 
was based on how many clicks that came through, the quality of the traffic that comes through, the quality of the people that, that actually land on your landing page, and do they, do they convert? And then more importantly, do they become brand ambassadors in turn to help you spread? Because from a social standpoint, it's your first set of traffic is really what's going to define how everything else is going to spread. And so if your first set of traffic isn't good enough, your content isn't going to spread. And so looking at the quality of that first set of traffic and determining you know, the, the, the virality of, uh, of that traffic is, is how we looked at it. So every person, how many pe more people did, did they talk to specifically? And you know, what was that virality portion? You know, how many sort of had that spread? So. so if you look at the Twitter and Facebook trending, you know, now applied to voice and some of the top television shows, uh, what would you say are some of the new directions in trending in social media that may have not been applied yet to television that are coming? Uh, in, in terms of trends, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that I kind of look at from a, you know, from a music world specifically from there, I mean, we talk about Spotify all the time, and we look at how people are consuming content by looking at what I, you know, just listen to and my friends listen to. I think in the television world, I think that's sort of the next step, in my opinion, is not consuming content, or not looking at something, or not viewing something based on you know, ads or what directed me, but specifically looking at people that I trust and what they're looking at and following those people. And that's essentially the next step in the cycle is I don't believe what, you know, what the ads tell me, I believe what I, people that I trust. And let me follow content that they, those people trust. So it's like the, the, the trending of your social graph, yeah. right? right? In essence, is coming to mm -hmm. video programs. Right. How, how far in... I was going to say, I think you hit on something really important, which was the, the first point of traction. Um, I think when you mentioned the Super Bowl, you know, one of the most successful Super Bowl spots was one that didn't even appear on uh, national TV, which was one that appeared in Kansas City, on, and that uh, featured uh, Will Ferrell and for, was it Keith uh, Bush beer or something? But, you know, it, was, it went viral because a small group of people got their hands on it, and, um, you know, everyone else wanted to see what it was because it wasn't on, on TV, and it kind of exploded. I think the same thing goes for any form of content. Um, you know, you've seen a lot of celebrities. I know, you know, Jay-Z has Life and Times, his YouTube channel, but they have almost no content, so they're looking for content, and he just wants to see himself as the amplifier. So um, there's lots of those points of, of first impact, I guess you would call it, um, where I think there's opportunities for people to take advantage of. And that's a good, the good point. I think let's let's talk for a moment, um, Ryan, about you know the Jay Z channel. Here you have one of the top brands on so many different platforms because he's a multi, multi, maybe billion dollar enterprise at this point. So you're, he's reaching consumers at many level beyond music. Don't you think a brand like that would actually have value for a content producer to be associated with to promote the content more so than maybe some of the traditional media brands? Yeah, I mean, I think you see a lot with, with celebrities now where early on, you know, when, when new media models were, were uh, first starting, celebrities kind of wanted to own it and, and, um, and actually have a hand in the actual development. And, you know, that, it, that'd be their brand. And now they've realized that their value is really as the amplifier. Um, so there's lots of celebrities you see just kind of putting their hands here and there, but really just focusing on their social media channels as a way to kind of get audience for whatever content you're making. Jesse, you've seen all the different celebrity channels as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I, I guess I kind of disagree with what you're okay. saying. Okay, um, I, I like when panelists yeah. disagree. Yeah. I think First your one. audience does too, right? Yeah. I, I want to go back to what you said um, about using uh, about you know curating content through your friends. Uh, and there's a new company that just launched called Chill.com that's doing exactly that with video and is worth taking a look at. And their growth is exponential. They've gone from I mean like I talked to them less than a week ago, and they were like, "We just grew by a hundred thousand today." And I got an email this morning they're like, "We just hit a million today." I mean, it's just taking off, and it's exactly that. It's your social graph curating your video content, and so I think they're going to do really well. Um, in terms of you know this whole idea of, of uh, celebrity and using celebrity to amplify content, um, most of the celebrities that I, and I've worked with a few, um, you know, I see a legend, um, and 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 through Idol, um, 
most of them came into the marketplace um, because they saw it as, one, they wanted to learn about digital, they think it's the way of the future, so they want to create content for it. Two, they want to, they absolutely want to own their content whenever possible. And by the way, they're not the only ones. Um, I want to own content when I produce it. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but there's a lot of people who are working towards doing that. Um, they like the creative license that, uh, you know, creating um, content in the space allows. Some people will use their name to curate the content like you're talking about. Um, those are people who have enormous brands. Um, but, how do I say this delicately? Um, you know, you can buy a tweet, right? So in a sense, that's kind of what we're talking about. When, when I hear people say that, you know, yes, there are people out there who will sell a tweet. You can go, you know, spend X amount of money on the Kardashians and, and they will tweet about your product. Um, I don't, I don't think that belongs in this conversation, honestly, <laughs> about reinventing the television model. That's about hawking a product um, and just using a different kind of medium to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think, and, you know, there's, there's no right way and wrong way and there's no kind of set path. You know, I tend to be a little bit bombastic and talk about things, you know, over-exaggerating what's happening in the market, but this is an exception to everything. I want to be clear about that. So when we talk about television, um, I, I always love these panels because they, they really shift from, from quarter to quarter as digital Hollywood comes and, and, and especially in the television market in the last two or three years because really what is television anymore? Is it NBC? Is it CBS? Is it one of the 400 nationally distributed cable networks? Is it Hulu? Is it Netflix? Is it one of your companies? Is it the product that you're putting onto some other aggregated network? What is television? How would we define it? What do you think it is, John? Well, I think, I think in a lot of ways the industry is kind of in flux, and I think that's what's really kind of shaking out. You know, nobody knows if the super networks of the future are going to be ABC and Fox, Print or Verizon, or Yahoo and Google. And, and you know, search, somebody mentioned search here earlier, and search is definitely going to be a big part of it with all the choices we have. There was a great Wired article from 1997 where Yahoo was saying, well, we don't know what the future is going to be, but people are going to need to search, and we're in the search business, and they're still here, right? So um, I think, you know, the digital changeover was a big thing that, that kind of came and went that people aren't still remembering. You know, as TV, as TV viewer goes to the web, as the mobile space matures into a viable platform for video, and content lives everywhere, that's when these new networks are really going to form. The plan that the FCC used to switch from analog to digital is the same plan down to the market that they used to switch from black and white to color in the 60s. <laughs> the government at some point is going to weigh in big, and I can assure you the period we're in now is this Westinghouse period. How is Westinghouse going to become CBS? They'll be writing history, textbooks about this in 20 years. This is very much the period that we're in. It's the dawn of a new golden age. It's why it's exciting, and all of you should be very excited to be in it. I cannot tell you how many of my peers in mainstream television are very successful, say to me all the time, I just need to get through another couple of years because I know that my time is over, okay? And it is. And this is also an exciting time to take chances because we can write the rules as we go and break them along the way. And I can assure you, once they figure out how to flip the light switch and then we get to this point of clarity when everything shakes out, there'll be enough space and money for everyone. It's just a matter of staying alive long enough. So, so the, my next question is for Ryan, and then I'm going to ask the audience to, to ask a question. And that is, is now television going to be sort of something you bring with you wherever you go? Is, you know, is it really, it's, is it, it's no longer at home, right? Is it out of home? Is it mobile? Is it with you wherever you are? What does it, where is television? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, so we're focused mostly on the technology side, not necessarily on the end consumer experience. You know, we're focused on the fact that there's no way for you to easily get your content to iTunes Extra unless you want to pay, you know, 40 grand. There's no easy way for you to um, transfer your assets from, you know, one file management company to another file management company for distribution purposes or to add value by doing behind the scenes and extras. Um, I, I think when it comes to app, uh, specifically the iPad, um, you know, our vision is that it's, it's about enabling um, kind of a, a, a bundled content experience you can watch wherever. Um, you know, it, you have to default to streaming because of kind of the, the technology challenges you have right now, but giving people the option to watch it on a plane um, and watch, you know, as an individual experience. But, you know, the re real thing that we're trying to kind of uh, pioneer is, is 
about kind of uh, contextual overlays. So, you know, the ability to play around with, um, uh, you know, you're watching an episode and halfway through the episode there's a, a flash on the screen, you click it, you can see, you know, an ad pop up about the product that's there, you can watch it behind the scenes, you learn more information about the, um, the, the character, you know, really how do you how to make that content, you know, more immersive so someone can engage with it. So, you know, it was, it was the right person to answer this question because the technology is here, or almost here, that will make the viewer experience ubiquitous as to where they can watch whatever they want to watch and whenever. And that, that was really not that easy to, and we, we knew that it was going to happen 20 years ago, I think, when Digital Hollywood started, but no one really could foresee it from a technology perspective. And here we have a technology platform saying, well, we're working on this and this and this part of it just to make sure that we get it done. So. We, we pretty much demonstrated that every <laughs> everything in television as we know it and as we call it has changed and we should probably call this new world something else possibly. I don't have any suggestions if you guys do go ahead and yeah, Jess, you have one? No, I don't have an for it, but it, it just, <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing about this conversation is we're talking about platforms of distribution, but the content is content and, you know, whether it's 22 or, or what, it, to me, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it, can you tell a story, right? I was I spoke at uh, a career day in my high but school. But is it linear? Huh? But is it linear yeah, story? So I, hold on, but I, I spoke at a career day okay. in my high school this past weekend, right? So and, you know, three classrooms full of sophomore kids, right? Um, and I was I asked everybody, "What do you watch?" Right? And they all watch what they we see on TV. None of them can have televisions at that school. Right? So they're watching the same content, they're just finding different platforms for it. So you think that the, the quality programming that we see on some of the networks and cable networks is still going to remain sort of the driving force because people still watch that. But God knows next year we may have a different conversation. I, I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. We might. We might. So do you guys have any questions for our panelists? Brian. Brian's going to throw tomatoes on me. Brian said first. No, I just want to kind of reinforce what <laughs> Jesse has said just from the field of experience, which is, one, we've now bundled, in these two productions that we're doing, we've now bundled um, the media buy into the production budget. Mm -hmm. So when we're pitching, um, and we ask for certain of the things that we're doing, that all the numbers come in, who do you expect to hit, what's the fan base, there's a whole bunch of criteria that are a little bit different than television because we're looking at the, the cue of the star that might be involved. Um, and all this information is then transmitted to the brands. And we managed through this last production to get the CPM down from 37 to 16, uh, which is quite amazing. And so this idea of being able to package content that's desirable, then to bring in and fund this content by, with technology companies providing part of the funding, brands providing, that allows the storytellers to actually hold their IP. There's no rule about length. There's no. There's not even a cost per minute associated with it. It is more or less because there. If we figure out the budget, we know what we're shooting, and we're also shifting the burden of creating extraneous content. I would call it extraneous. I would say extended content onto the users and asking them. And suddenly, our library is expanded. So I'm voting for the model that you were talking about because we're kind of living it right now, and it's what the brands and the technology companies are sparking to. And just to take that one step further, with one program that we're doing, we're actually looking towards um, a company called Seven One in Europe that would actually finance it as a European co-production and sell it back to the United States because American showrunners now are running abroad. Um, Frank Spotnitz is creating for the BBC. James Manos is there. Stephen Gallagher goes back and forth. A guy named Sven Clausen. So there's that model. And the other thing is that uh, Lillehammer was actually produced and is on television in Norway. I think we need to have you up on the panel. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think know, we missed the I panelist. would hire him in a minute because, <laughs> because it's just what exactly what you say is exactly in, in my on the ground experience what's happening. The only thing is is that every single case is different. Yes. There's, there's no template for it. You have to figure it out as you go, and you have to build the business model in the room, literally, while you're negotiating. So I'd like to um, ask a question of the two of you then, because if we're in a room with, with <laughs> content producers, do, do you, um, does that model then dilute the, the, the ownership of the content? For no, the, be, 
because in certain cases, what we're trying to do now. How, how do you maintain that as well? Well, the, first of all, the ads and the brands, they want, John was right, they want brands as characters in the story. They don't want integration. They want so much more than that. So now they're actually sitting in the writer's room with us. However, they don't want to own the IP of the storyteller. And the big complaint is when you're Tim Crane or you're JJ, you don't own your rights. You know, and so you can't build the audience around it. You can't build more franchises. This model allows them to hold on to their rights, and, and that's what you do going in. And I'll tell you, there are a few lawyers that know how to do this. And then the next big horizon, which I think Jesse and I talked about, is if I'm Tim Crane and I've got 65 million fans around the world, and all those fans are going to come to content that I create, they're creating data, and I own none of the money and none of the value from the data that I'm actually driving. So that's the next horizon for storytellers, is to own a share of the revenue of that data. And possibly the libraries, right? Which is the ultimate, sure. so that so you can true. actually extrapolate the revenue in perpetuity and not for a window or a period of time, which we didn't even address the windows. Right. Go ahead, Jeff. Which is huge. <laughs> but to, um, to Brian's point, you know, you talk about financing, how you're going into foreign financing. The television model, the traditional television model, is changing as well as you're starting to see where a lot of the money is coming from the foreign marketplace. So if you look at the firm, for instance, you know, that's funded through four and it's shot in Canada. NBC gets it for a commitment of 22 episodes at probably a third of the license fee, right? So they don't have to get the same numbers, but it's the cachet of NBC that also drives the foreign finance. And it's a pre-sale kind of like you would yeah. do with a film. And, and, right? and we're doing that, honestly, we're doing that in, 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 you know, the new media space as well. I don't have a conversation with a domestic distributor without having a conversation with a foreign sales outlet first because I want to know that there's potential in the foreign marketplace um, and then I can go and I can alleviate risk. So when I go to Hulu, when I go to Yahoo, when I go to whomever, right, with content, I can say, and it will sell it foreign and I'll kiss you in on that deal, but, you know, for this much rather than you owning the whole thing. With international sale, um, like in the film business, it, you know, it can go up to way over 50% and up to 70, 80% of Absolutely. the budget. Is that similar to this? Well, it depends if you're doing a pre-sale. Sometimes I'm just doing, look, there, it, it's always going to be hard to determine, especially with this content in the media space, right? I want to know that there's an opportunity. Now, I'm doing something right now where, um, yes, we've taken a sizzle reel for the content that we're creating. We've gone to the foreign marketplace and we have, uh, we're in lengthy discussions with uh, a, a television outlet for all of the rest of the world. And you can do that. Um, are we going to take that money first? No. I'm funding it through brands in the United States. And this happens to be content that's conducive to brands. But by funding with brands, they're not going to own it. I'm going to own it. Um, you know, my domestic distributor will have a partnership in it because they're helping us raise the money. Um, so there will be a lot of people who have their hands in the pie, and I have no problem with that because I think I believe in win-wins for everybody. Um, but well, everybody will make more money using this model. And right? it works. And for it's no everybody. different than television. Right? And Brian has. Yeah. Brian wants to add. And if you go the other way, remember <laughs> this, is, this is global now. If you go the other way, way, you can get tax breaks in yeah. other countries, Good and point. there are. Canada, the UK, many countries in Europe, they all have mandates mm -hmm. for digital media. And those mandates are providing funding as well. So for those of you that know Canadians, I mean, I, I happen to think that Americans are the, I'm sorry, the best storytellers in the world, yeah. really good storytellers. We're able to create emotional bonding faster than anybody. And they're looking to us, and that's why the showrunners are running. And if you look at Maker Studios, if you look at any of these digital studios, Machinima, they're all localizing their content. These stars are localizing, YouTube stars are localizing content for South America and whatnot. So there's a, there's, that's how it's changing, is that it's a global market. And it, it's hard to define the rules, you're right, because it changes all the time. But there's so much opportunity if you just look at the behavior of what's happening. So the, it, we're at a very interesting time in this space. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the panelists for <laughs> tearing apart the television model, if we can call it that, one by one, they tore it apart. And now by putting it all together with you, with the audience, with Brian's help and everyone's help, appreciate appreciate putting it back together into something new that we envision as this model. And thank you for coming to hear us this afternoon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Mariana, and thank you to this wonderful panel. And uh, for those of you that want to hear a little more from Brian Seth Hurst, 